One night, as I returned from work, John and Mike approached me. Hey Emily, you wouldn't mind giving up this house, right? What did you say? I mean, you're always busy with work and hardly at home. You don't have any special attachment to this house, do you? Hey, what do you mean? We plan to inherit this house. Mike shouted loudly. I'll be living here, so you should leave. As I widened my eyes, the two of them laughed loudly. Well, you're not family, just our cash cow. I sighed heavily. Rather than sadness, a sense of emptiness filled my heart. And I didn't have the energy to retort. Fine, I'll leave. Yes. Yay. Watching the two celebrate coldly, I whispered in my heart. How much do these two intend to mock me? John can't survive on his part-time job earnings, yet they see me as nothing but a cash cow. I've had enough. If the two of them feel that way, I will also stop holding on to the name of family. Be prepared, both of you. I am Emily Smith, a 48-year-old ordinary wife with a job. I lost my parents before reaching adulthood, but I managed to get a job in a big company. By the way, I have been working full-time even after getting married. My husband, John Smith, is a full-time house husband. So I leave the household chores to him and focus all my energy on work. Thanks to John, I can work late into the night without worrying about the house or going on business trips. It would be nice if I could say that, but the reality is different. Actually, John is not very good at household chores. When he hangs laundry, it always ends up wrinkled. He doesn't rinse the dishes before putting them in the dishwasher. So the cleaned dishes are always dirty. Even when he cooks, the result is either undercooked or burnt. Naturally, I cook a lot on weekends or meal prep before going to work and cook after returning home. After John and our son, Mike, go to bed. It's a routine for me to spend time re-washing dirty dishes or ironing out the wrinkles in the laundry. I continue this daily routine, pushing my exhausted body to finish cleaning before I sleep. I've tried teaching my husband the correct ways several times, but nothing has changed. So I stopped mentioning it. My biggest concern lately is that I don't feel at home in my own house. John and Mike team up and exclude me. John and I used to work at the same company. As we worked together in the same department, we became attracted to each other and started dating. Our relationship became serious and held our wedding ceremony the following year. We had a child and were living happy days then, one day, as soon as John returned home. He suddenly said this to me. I've submitted my resignation to the company. What did you say? You know, after we got married, I was transferred to the current department, right? My boss is really unbearable. So, I just couldn't stand it anymore. But we're expecting a baby soon, and we've just taken out a mortgage on the house. Are you sure about resigning? As I asked anxiously, John gave a light smile. Emily, you plan to work after giving birth, right? You don't have to take maternity leave. You can resume work immediately. I'll become a house husband. You say that easily, but you, living at your parents' house until before our marriage. Hardly ever used a knife. Do you think you can handle it? You don't need to worry that much. I can learn quickly by watching cooking videos on YouTube. True, considering my future career, I was planning to return to work after taking a one-year maternity leave. I wanted to take time to watch the growth of our child closely. But now, he's suggesting I abandon that plan to support our living expenses and hurry back to work. I felt uneasy, but John's determination was unwavering. In the end, I continued working until 42 days before my expected delivery date and returned to work just eight weeks after giving birth. It was hard leaving my baby, who couldn't yet hold his head up, at a daycare center. But the fact that Mike grew healthily without any night cries was a relief for us. Driven by a sense of duty to support my family, I worked hard and spent a lot of time with Mike on weekends. John adores Mike. On weekends, three of us would take walks in a nearby park. And as Mike got a bit older, we'd take him to zoos and aquariums. Feels like we're on a date after a long time, 
doesn't it? Next time, let's ask your mother to look after Mike and go on a date, just the two of us. Sounds good. Let's go to that restaurant. On the hill with the beautiful night view we visited before. I'll make a reservation. We smiled at each other while watching the fish swim in the large aquarium. In hindsight, this might have been the happiest time for us. But after I was promoted to section chief and my salary increased, John's attitude began to change. As my overtime, weekend work, and business trips increased, John started making sarcastic remarks at me. And he made sure Mike could hear them. Mike, mommy's finally back. I wonder why she always comes back so late. Maybe she went to a bar or something. Mom, is that true? I stayed up waiting for you. Hey Mike, I was really working. I'm sorry for making you wait. One weekend day. Working again on your day off? Well, since we can't help it. Mike and I will go watch a movie. Seems like mommy loves her job more than she loves Mike. Mom, is that true? Do you not care about me? Seeing Mike's tears made my heart ache. That's not true, Mike. Mommy loves you very much. John, don't talk to Mike like that. But it's the truth, isn't it? Emily prioritizes money over family. Every time John laughed mockingly, I felt more irritated. When Mike started elementary school, John began working part-time three times a week. However, he frequently changed jobs, from supermarkets to gas stations. And whenever something bothered him, he'd quit quickly. Changing jobs so frequently isn't good, you know. Shut up. How I earn my pocket money is my business. For a moment, I thought I had misheard. Pocket money? So you're not planning to contribute your part-time job earnings to our household finances? We should think about Mike's education fees and our savings for retirement, don't you think? The pocket money I get from you is hardly enough. I'm just managing things on my own. Since you're working, I don't see why I need to strain myself working more. I was at a loss for words. Even though I provided him with $350 every month. Hearing that it wasn't enough was honestly shocking. He's probably spending the money on in-game purchases. Still, I could somehow endure John's sarcastic remarks. The problem was the behavior of our beloved son, Mike. Particularly, as Mike entered junior high school, his attitude became exceedingly difficult. For instance, the recent Parents' Day. I'm thinking of taking a half day off for the Parents' Day at Mike's school. Mike snorted in response. You don't have to, really. You probably don't want to go anyway, right? Why do you think that? That's not how I feel. When I questioned him, Mike replied coldly. Because you prioritize your job, right? You went back to work immediately after giving birth to me, didn't you? Is it your hobby to earn money and enjoy watching the increasing numbers in your savings book? Valuing money over your child, what a lonely life that must be. At those sarcastic words, I was left speechless. Your father said that, right? He did. But it's true, isn't it? Ah, can you not talk to me during breakfast? It affects my appetite. I'm sorry. Since we can't always have dinner together. I thought at least we could talk during breakfast. Leaving his breakfast untouched, Mike left for school. From the next day on, Mike stopped having breakfast. According to John, it's because talking to mom in the morning depresses him. And this happens because you neglect the child and are always working. John laughed mockingly. Even on days off, he says the mood is gloomy when you're home. That's why he hangs out at his friends' places all the time. I see. Since elementary school, I've always attended his school events, right? The moms of Mike's classmates call me a hands-on dad. Why don't you learn something from me? After he left, I sat down at the dining table, looking down. Despite working hard to support the family, why am I treated with such disrespect? Even when I try to spend time with my child, he avoids me. My husband teaches the child to see me as the enemy. My chest tightened with frustration and despair. Holding back sobs, I asked myself, 
Is there any meaning to being together as a family if I'm the only one being treated like this? A few days later, when I returned from work, I saw a light coming from a window on the first floor. At this hour, it was unusual. A feeling of unease crossed my mind. Usually, at this time, both John and Mike have already showered and are in their rooms. As I entered the kitchen, saying, I'm home, the two of them simultaneously turned their gaze toward me. Emily, there's something I want to discuss. John looked at me with a serious expression. Can I change my clothes first? It'll be quick. Reluctantly, I sat down in front of the two of them, still in my work suit. Then, John leaned forward to ask. Hey, Emily, you'd be okay with giving up this house, right? What do you mean? After all, you're always busy with work and hardly ever at home. You don't have any special attachment to this house, do you? I raised my eyebrow. John and I decided everything with the house manufacturer about the house. The flooring, the size of the living room, and the specifications for the toilet and bath. For 16 years, we've lived happily in this home. It's filled with memories. And it's only natural to be attached to it. What do you mean? We intend to inherit this house. Mike shouted, looking straight at me. I'll be living here, so you need to leave. As my eyes widened in shock, the two of them laughed loudly. Well, you're not really family, you're our cash cow. Even though dad does all the household chores, it's strange that the house is under mom's name. Eventually, it'll be under my name. You should transfer it to me while you're still alive. I sighed deeply. Rather than feeling sad, a sense of emptiness filled my heart. And I didn't have the strength to say anything back. Yeah, I get it. I'll leave. Yes. Yay. As I coldly watched the two of them celebrate, I whispered to myself. How much more do they plan to mock me? Despite John only having a part-time wage. They think of me as nothing but a cash cow. Enough is enough. If they feel that way, I won't hold on to the title of family any longer. Be prepared, you too. I decided to move out and started looking for a new place. Contacting a nearby short-stay apartment. I found a vacant room and proceeded with the lease. Having used the short-stay apartment for business trips, the process was smooth. After finding a new home and feeling relieved, I went to the city hall during my lunch break the next day, obtained a seal certificate, and started preparing a deed of gift. The name transfer was completed, and in about two weeks, the land title deed arrived. I sent it to Mike, along with the divorce forms, and he contacted me right away. From today, this house is mine. Once you're divorced from Dad, you're a stranger to me. Don't contact me anymore. Of course, that's my intention too. Tell your father to submit the papers as soon as possible. Even if the bond of marriage breaks, the bond between parent and child doesn't, at least legally. I wanted to say that, but I didn't want to ruin Mike's elated mood, so I kept quiet. A few days later, after returning from work, I saw dozens of missed calls and messages from Mike and John on my phone. Thinking it was about time, I called Mike. What is it? I thought I told you not to contact me. Mom. I need to talk. The voice of Mike coming from the phone was shaking. I had no idea. That the home loan was still pending. Oh, I thought you knew. In $1,400 at that. You know dad's monthly salary is only $530, right? How are we supposed to pay this off? Who knows? It's not my problem. It was clear from the beginning. After I responded coldly, John spoke next. His tone sounding like he wanted sympathy. I forgot about the loan. Emily, please help. We'll go bankrupt at this rate. Whose fault do you think it is that the amount became like this? When we were newlyweds, I didn't have any particular preferences for our living space. I had a rough idea of how much it would cost to raise a child. And I wasn't interested in a single family house with a garden. I was fine with any type of accommodation. However, John believed, for raising a child, 
A new single family house with a garden and garage is the best. As soon as he found out I was pregnant, he brought home a bunch of brochures from house manufacturers and passionately explained them to me. To ensure our child grows up well, we need a spacious living room. A garage for three cars would be good. The bedroom and walk-in closet combined should be about 400 square feet. Isn't that too big? To my surprise, John at that time told me with a serious look. The feng shui master said that the bedroom needs to be more comfortable than the living room. If it's too small, you won't sleep well. Hmm, I wonder. Also, I want to make the living room open to the ceiling. And have a free space on the second floor. And so, our requests surprised the house manufacturers one after another. A south-facing corner plot, a large piece of land, a trustworthy manufacturer. Proximity to a train station and supermarket, because we wanted everything perfect. The loan amount became quite high. For Mr. Smith, if you make the bonus payments zero, the monthly loan would be $1,400. Would that be acceptable? That's not a problem. Right, Emily? We can make the payments, but... Back then, my salary was higher than John's, so the house was registered under my name. Honestly, I regretted that we didn't save more for a down payment before building the house. I'm at a loss for words, forgetting about the remaining loan on a house. That was hastily built under John's insistence. Maybe I should give John a piece of my mind this time. I'm on my way there, I told Mike and headed home. When I opened the front door of the house, the smell of raw garbage wafted out. It was exactly as I had imagined, so I entered the room without any particular surprise. Looking at the kitchen, dirty dishes were piled up in the sink, and the garbage can was overflowing. Leftover drink bottles and plastic containers were scattered on the living room table. Both Mike and John, previously very assertive, were now sitting side by side at the dining table. Looking down. As I sat opposite them, Mike approached me with a smile and started to speak. I heard from Dad. Mom had been covering all our living expenses. That's right. After all, this man here used all of his small earnings on personal expenses. Not just living expenses, he made me pay for everything. What, so I don't even get an allowance? John spoke back. And I've been doing all the housework. I should be able to use my own salary freely, right? That's as good as not doing it at all. Mike said in an irritated tone. The laundry is all wrinkled, dishes that were supposedly cleaned are still dirty. The fish is burnt, and the meat is undercooked. Plus, you hardly ever take out the trash. Everything's half done. If you don't like it, then you do it. You don't have to speak that way. It's a parent's responsibility to take care of a minor. Mike turned to me and let out a deep sigh. This house was stable because mom took care of everything. Finally realized it, have you? John reacted unhappily to my words. And if Emily would have told me properly, maybe I would have fixed it. Instead, you go behind my back to redo things. It's your fault, Emily. I stopped telling you because every time I did, you'd sulk or get angry. It took more effort. You're not a child, I shouldn't have to point things out constantly. You felt no love towards me, huh? Says the man who kicked his wife out of the house. Mike covered his face with his hands and slouched in response to the argument between John and me. I might not be able to go to a good high school, my GPA isn't so good. But I always thought I'd go to a private high school because we had money. But with our financial situation, I can't even afford the admission fee. We hardly have any savings. Does it cost that much to go to a private school? John asked, sounding surprised. Didn't the teacher explain it during the parent-teacher conference? Mike, your father is useless. He never listens to anyone and has no understanding of money. Seems that way. Earning a monthly salary of $530 and yet spending $200 on a game is beyond my comprehension. And spending money on hobbies isn't a bad thing, is it? John looked puzzled. I wish you'd earn as much as mom does, dad. 
And that's difficult for me. I became a house husband because I didn't want to work. John stated boldly, causing Mike to get angry. You can't even manage the household chores properly. And yet you proudly call yourself a house husband. Now, wait a moment, Mike. John tried to calm Mike down. If Emily can't manage, we have another option. Huh? What other option? John showed a smile. We have your grandma, don't we? Mike's eyes lit up. Go oh, right, grandma. She's a landlord in the countryside and lives a wealthy life, right? And your grandma has always been very fond of you. If she knows you're in trouble, she'd definitely help out. I haven't visited her in a while, so I didn't even think of that. It's really reassuring to have wealthy relatives. John smiled contentedly, crossed his arms, and spoke to me in a triumphant tone. It's a shame that Emily no longer has her parents. There's no one to help you out when things get tough. Well, keep struggling for a living and do your best. But I'm different. I have a wealthy mother, after all. Even if I had parents, I believe marital issues should be resolved between the couple. I retorted sarcastically. That's why it's a last resort. I believe Grandma will definitely help us out. Exactly. She might easily give us around $67,000. Seeing the two of them getting excited, I took a deep breath and suggested. Why don't you try calling her then? John pulled out his phone and dialed his mother excitedly. Uh, Mom? I can't give you any money. Both John and Mike were surprised at her statement. Just then, the doorbell rang, and I went to welcome the guest at the door. Upon seeing the person who had just come in, both John and Mike almost fell out of their chairs. Huh? Mom? Standing there was John's mother in flashy attire, pulling a pink suitcase. Grandma, why are you here? I came to the city to watch a play of my favorite actor. Mrs. Smith replied while putting away her phone. After a quick glance at John and Mike, she looked around the room. It hasn't even been a month since Emily left, and look at the state of this place. Aren't you ashamed, calling yourself a house husband? John bit his lip and looked down. Although he always speaks his mind to me, he never stands up to his mother, making it quite embarrassing for him. Mrs. Smith sternly gazed at John and Mike. I've heard everything. Even though Emily takes care of you, you verbally abuse her daily and even kick her out of the house that's in her name. You foolish son and grandson, have you lost your minds? Emily got a promotion at work and became a section chief. A wife outdoing her husband in a career, that's unthinkable, right? That's why I badmouthed her in front of Mike on purpose. I thought I'd feel better if our son disliked her. I sighed at his pettiness. Exactly, it's all dad's fault. I'm the victim here, grandma. Isn't that right? Hey, don't try to play innocent. Mike stood up, approached his grandmother, and with teary eyes, begged her for forgiveness. Please, I beg you to cover my high school entrance fees and tuition. Now that mom has abandoned us, you're the only one I can ask. I can't trust dad. The last part wasn't necessary, but it's true we have no money. Mom, I'm also asking you. John stepped forward with Mike, confidently stating. Actually, children are expensive. If you could assist us with around $3,300 per month, it would be helpful. Wait, you need that much? Before I could hold myself back, John continued with confidence. I remember you once said you wanted to spend money helping others. I think this is a noble way to do so. It's your grandson and son asking for help. I struggled to hold back my laughter. John didn't have the attitude of someone who was genuinely asking for help. John's mother's face turned bright red, and her anger exploded. Silence. How dare you both make such shameless requests. You just want money for your games, don't you? That's a misunderstanding. Of course, there'll be money left for living expenses too. John flinched. Please, Grandma. I don't want to go to public school. Mike pleaded earnestly, but his grandma responded clearly. Then study hard and get a scholarship. 
but I'm not good at studying. You're always looking for ways to slack off without putting in the effort, right? You're just like your father. True, indeed. Perhaps I made a mistake in how I raised him. Mrs. Smith and I sighed. With a face full of anger, Mrs. Smith spoke in a tone that wouldn't accept any counterarguments. The money is what we, as a couple, worked hard to save. There's not a single penny for lazy people like you two. From now on, please don't contact us. You're just a nuisance. John and Mike, from being so defiant, became immensely shaken. Especially John, who seemed to think his wealthy mother-in-law would definitely help. What do we do? How are we going to survive from tomorrow? Dad, what happened to your salary this month? Wasn't payday just yesterday? And I spent it all on in-game purchases. I was planning to ask your grandma for the utility bills too. What? You're kidding, right? I instinctively covered my face with my hand. Does John feel any responsibility as a father? Mom. What, what should we do? I'm not your mother. I'm just a money cow to you, right? Don't come clinging to me now. I coldly stated, and John and Mike looked down. To me, you both are now strangers. From now on, the two of you have to manage on your own. And, have you gone through the documents from the lawyer? Eh? What are you talking about? I'm planning to demand compensation for the verbal abuse you've inflicted upon me. You'll have to pay the compensation every month. You can pay in installments, but if you default, I'll have your salary garnished. So, take care of that. And that's impossible. I also have credit card debt. What? I didn't know. How much is the debt? Roughly $13,000. Seeing Mike in shock, I said with a touch of pity, That's tough. You both, as father and son, will have to combine your efforts to repay it. A moving company will come to collect my belongings, so just leave them be. Oh dear, look at the time. I need to buy some merchandise before the show starts, so I'll take my leave. Mrs. Smith and I left the house, leaving John and Mike, who seemed on the verge of tears. John, now desperate, tried borrowing money from relatives and friends but was naturally refused. Eventually, it seems they finally realized they couldn't sustain their current lifestyle. They sold their house, used the money for utilities and debt repayment, and moved to a rundown apartment. John went through numerous job interviews and eventually found work as a clerk at a small company. He works full-time during the weekdays and takes part-time jobs on the weekends diligently paying off the compensation to me. Mike studied hard, got into a private school, and moved into its dormitory. Since he can't rely on his father, he's been working part-time jobs to earn money. Actually, as part of our property division, half of my savings will be given to John. However, it was clear that if I handed the money over to John, he would quickly spend it all. So, I decided to manage the money myself as a college fund for Mike. When I called my ex-mother-in-law from the short-stay apartment, she, who had come all the way from the other side of the state, apologized. I'm truly sorry for the trouble my son has caused. Being the youngest of three brothers, he's been spoiled since childhood. And it seems he's facing the consequences now. I had hoped that by marrying the dependable Emily, he would change. But it seems that hope was in vain. I felt I had to explain to you the circumstances of the divorce. And I never expected you to come all the way from so far. Filled with gratitude for my mother-in-law, who had taken several hours to come here. I was overwhelmed. There was a play I wanted to see, so the timing was perfect. Emily, please count on me more. Don't suffer alone. I am like a parent to you, after all. Thank you so much. I will keep that in mind. My heart warmed at the kind words of Mrs. Smith. Having lost my parents at a young age, I deeply appreciated her kindness. Later on, I moved to a one-bedroom apartment and started living busy but fulfilling days. Freed from the sarcastic remarks and pressures from my husband and son, my mood brightened and my health improved. 
John and Mike seem to have a good relationship with Mrs. Smith, sharing updates with her through messages and calls. Also, when I can take consecutive holidays, I visit Mrs. Smith, we go to cafes, watch movies or musicals, and continue our unchanged relationship even after the divorce. I may have divorced John, but my bond with my son Mike continues. I plan to continue to watch over Mike's growth from a distance, through Mrs. Smith.